Hiya. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Renee McLennan and as the Mayor of the Town of Bassendine, it's my privilege to welcome you all here tonight. Um, it's really important to us here at the Town of Bassendine at the start of every time we meet to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And our town, the Town of Bassendine, is founded on the lands of the Wajak Noongar people. And I just want to say that we pay our respects to the Noongar people of this land and that we um, respect the stewardship of the land that they have given for so many years. And we honour the people and we really value their ongoing contribution to our community and the culture in the town of Bassendine. So it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. There are lots of people who are familiar and who are recognised council events and meetings, but there are also many of you. Sarah has an enormous heart and she is someone that is really brings a lot of inspirational blue sky thinking to council. So that's something that I really value about Sarah. Councillor Jai Wilson sitting next to Sarah. Again, he's been on council for one year, has many qualities as do all of our councillors, but some of the strengths that I see are his strategic thinking and his ability to look at long-term vision for our town. Councillor Melissa Mikachuk. Um, we have become very good friends. She is a very caring person. And she brings a lot of considered thought to council and she also brings a passion and a lot of knowledge about environmental sustainability that's really valuable in the town of Bassendine where we've got wonderful environmental assets that we need to look after. And then Councillor Kath Hamilton. Um, Kath has an amazing attention to detail. She makes sure that everything is checked thoroughly and she also challenges us with her out-of-the-box <laughs> thinking. So thank you, Kath. Um, so, in addition to the councillors, we also have many dedicated staff that work for the town. Um, some of them are here tonight. I see some of them are here as community members as well. Um, so, I just want to introduce who we have with us here tonight. So, we have um, Peter Mabs, who is behind me. She's our new CEO, and you'll have the opportunity to hear from her later on um, this evening. I have Amy Holmes. She's our wonderful um, minute clerk. And then Greg Nery, who is our youth services is he manager of youth services but he's here helping us with IT tonight, so thank you, Greg. Um, Ken Lapham is our Acting Director of Corporate Services. Um, Graham Haggart, our Direct... Corporate Services. Services. Graham Haggart, our Director of Community Development. Um, Simon Stewart Dawkins, our Director of Operational yeah. Services. Mr Tony Dowling, our Director of Strategic Planning. And then Mr Brian Reid, who is our Manager of Development Services. Um, I... I want to thank all of you um, for the efforts that you put into serving our community. And I'm also aware that there have been a lot of changes in the last year, particularly in the more recent months. And so I want to thank all the staff who've really embraced those changes because I know that can be challenging. Um, and also for the shift where we now have a real um, sense of wanting to the town's administration, the council and the community to partner on things. So. Again, it's a big shift for the town, and so thank you to all the staff who've really embraced that and want to be on board to make even better things happen in our community. Um, so I'm pretty sure that most of us don't usually have annual general meetings as the highlight of our social calendar. So again, thank you for making the time to come here tonight. Um, you know, typically an annual general meeting would be pretty dry and boring, and I think that's probably true of many local governments as well. But we want to try and do things differently, not only in this meeting, but just as a local government as well. We want our local government to be much more relevant. We want it to be responsive and innovative, and we want it to represent a genuine relationship with our community. We want to be more inclusive, accessible, and we want to be more empowering of our community. And hopefully that's something that you will start to see more and more happening um, as time goes by. So we see this meeting tonight as um, another opportunity for us to be able to engage with our community, to flag some of the conversations that matter. Um, and it's been really wonderful to have the barbecue before this meeting tonight. I've had the chance to speak with people that I hadn't met before, hear some of their perspectives on our town, and all of that's really valuable for helping us to know, as a council, what direction you want us to be taking. Um, so tonight, um, with that in mind, um, I really hope that this can be a positive and productive meeting, and I want everybody who has something to say to have the chance to, to speak tonight. I'm sure that many of you, got, many of you have great ideas um, and you may have some issues that you want to raise. And some of those um, topics will probably require more discussion than what tonight will allow. But I want to reassure you that this is not the only forum where you can have your voice heard. So your councillors and the staff are very willing to meet with people to discuss things in um, more detail. Um, we, we all have email that we respond to. We have Facebook. You can engage through the Your Say platform. Um, but just keep the conversation going um, beyond tonight. Thank you. 
Um, I know that everybody here is um, really passionate about Bassendine um, and there are lots of different opinions in the room tonight. Um, and tonight I can, um, what we commit to is listening to those opinions. We want to hear your thoughts um, and we want to hear your concerns. And as I said before, we want the conversation to be positive, we want it to be productive. And so I just want to remind everyone in the room that we are neighbours and we are friends. So we want to keep um, showing respect to those around us, even if their opinion differs to ours. And I know we're a great community. We, we're all going to do that anyway. Because ultimately our success as a community moving forward is going to depend upon how well we can all work together um, as a community. So I just want to take a few minutes now to talk a little bit about the past 12 months and what's been happening in the town of Assendeen. So last year at the annual general meeting, we had a very new, fresh council. The, the four councillors here had only been elected six weeks earlier. There was a lot of change on the horizon. The community had clearly um, elected new people to represent them and there was a common focus of those people. Um, but last year we asked people to be patient. We knew that there was anticipation of change, but we also knew that change takes time. But over the past year, we have really worked at um, transforming the way that the local government in Bassendine is done. And much of this work has been back of house kind of things. So it goes unseen, but councillors have been working incredibly hard to make sure that all of the foundations, the systems and the culture in, are in place um, and that will allow us to deliver um, you know, great outcomes for the town in the future. So building that solid foundation and having some robust systems is really critical, not just planning um, planning our new projects, but also for reorientating the organisation, for encouraging innovation um, and the pursuit of best practice, ensuring high standards of governance and also genuine consultation, which is something that we're really focusing on. So partnership between the council and administration is also essential, and we feel that we now have the right combination to allow us to deliver the type of local government that Bassendine has been asking for. So traditionally, local governments have worked for the community, but we've been shifting our focus a bit so that now we want to work with the projects that we've been working on that we've been able to deliver or make substantial progress on in the last 12 months. Um, so I want to share a few of them with you. So, Merry Crescent play Playground. So the people in Eden Hill have long awaited having some new play equipment at Merry Crescent Reserve. And if any of you have driven past there in the last couple of weeks, you'll see that it's nearly completed. Hopefully this Friday it will be finished and we'll have the launch the following weekend. And so we invite all of the families in our town to come and be part of that. It's going to be a great event. Bassendean Men's Shed. We've got some of our wonderful Men's Shed members here tonight. Um, if you've been to any of our events recently, you often have these men contributing with parking or sausage sizzles. Um, but the Bassendean Men's Shed is soon to have their new shed constructed. Um, the tender is almost completed and it will be out very soon and we're anticipating that the shed will be operational um, later on this year. Um, the town was successful in uh, achieving a, or receiving a $200,000 Lottery West grant to help us with this project. And just last week we also heard that we were receiving an additional $20,000 from the federal government to help us to fit out the men's shed. So that's fantastic news for men and men's health in our community and it's something that we can all um, see as a really positive step forward. This is our infant health clinic. Um, it's at the end of James Street. It's a 60-year-old building. My mum took me there when I was a baby. I'm not 60, but um, <laughs> even at that stage, it was getting quite old. We have a growing number of young families in our community, and this is something that we really needed to prioritise in having um, an upgraded facility for. This is One Surrey Street and the Pensioner Guard Cottage. So we have... We have um, a beautiful historic building there in the Pensioner Guard Cottage, which is really valuable to the community. And then there's a homestead next to it. Now, this homestead um, we need to restore and refurbish, but we wanted to put it to a good community use. So over the last um, little while, there's been um, work being put into plans to, to use that um, residence next to the Pensioner Pensioner Guard Cottage to become the new infant health clinic, but also a really valuable community space that can be used for playgroups, meeting areas, and also to reflect the history of our area. So um, we're at the stage of finalising those plans and we're hoping that construction on this will happen in the second half of this year as well. Uh, another achievement in the last 12 months that I think the town should be really proud of is um, establishing a new reconciliation action plan. So reconciliation is really important to the town. We've got really strong 
um, links to the Aboriginal community here and really important Aboriginal history. And so as a town, we want to recognise that. We want to build the relationships with our local Aboriginal people. We want to empower them and improve the opportunities for them in our community. So we took our reconciliation action plan to the next level this year and there are a lot of strategies in that that we're going to be able to roll out over the coming years that will really help us to build those relationships. Sandy Beach Playground. Some of you have been hearing about this for a number of years and there have been a few challenges in the planning for this playground but after a short pause this year to help us to um, get some redirection, I feel like we're on track with this again and the playground is progressing and we should have some more news about how that's going to proceed in the coming months. Um, and of course, we've continued to deliver our really vibrant events program. There's a lot of things that happen in the town of BCD that are really amazing opportunities for our community to come together and connect, um, to spend time with family and friends. Um, hopefully, many of you participated in the community engagement we did over the last 12 months with Ricky Arnold. It was really fabulous engagement. We're soon to get the final um, copy of his report that gives us an insight into what people are wanting from their arts and um, cultural events in the town of Bassendine in the future. And that's really going to be a valuable document for us to shape the future um, event program and cultural plan for our town moving forward. So over the last 12 months, it's also been a good reminder that we are a progressive community and that we are a great place to trial new initiatives. So one of the things um, that many of you would have heard about is the introduction of a third bin. Um, we will be one of the first local governments in Western Australia who will introduce FOGO, which stands for Food Organics and Garden Organics. This is, um, you know, talking about rubbish doesn't sound that exciting, but it's a really positive step forward for the town of Bassendine. We're really showing leadership in this area. Um, at the moment, we only divert about 33% of our waste from landfill, but just with a simple introduction of a food organics and garden organics bin, we could raise it up to over 65% diversion. So we are planning on introducing this later on in the year. Um, the state government is soon to release their new waste strategy and um, having a third bin aligns perfectly with what they're trying to do. Um, and we're also going to be doing more than just the third bin. There's a lot of other waste initiatives that we're looking at as part of our own new strategy. And we want to do some things that look at circular and really um, people to shift the waste and consumerism. Really fortunate in Bassendine. So we've given the opportunity and selected from all the local governments and for the Plastic Free Initiative. So there's a, a person who has been allocated Town of Bassendine to work with our local businesses um, to help them to become plastic free champions. So this is a really positive thing, not only for the town, but for those businesses who are involved because it gives them a point of difference. And also, of course, it's good for our environment because it gives us much more sustainable um, practices. Another initiative that we're really proud Um, if some of you may have already had contact made by some of the Your Move coaches. Um, this is a free program that's offered to residents to help our community become more active, to get out, to walk, to cycle, to use public transport, just to think about different ways of getting places so that we can be more active, more healthy, to help bring our streets to life and to reduce our dependency on cars. So that really aligns with some of the, some of the priorities that our community has identified during our community strategic planning process. But um, the most significant um, achievement during the last 12 months, I would say, is through the appointment of our new CEO, Peter Mabs. Um, I know many of you have had the opportunity to meet her already because she has made a real effort to get out into the community and meet residents, business owners, um, everybody who spends time in the town of Bassendine. And the CEO is the individual who is responsible for delivering on council's vision. So having the right CEO is really important to enable council's vision and the community's vision, vision sorry, to be delivered to the community. Um, so Peter is an amazing individual. She'll speak to you a little bit soon, but she has an incredible track record in management and governance, but she also has really strong roots here in Bassendine, so her heart is here. She knows a lot of our history, and I think that's a really important part of what makes her such a good fit for this role. So I know that um, we're going to achieve really good things together um, with Council and with PD and the administration. So that's a little bit about the centre, but we're under no illusion that that is going to solve the problem, um, and it's that alone
alone is going to activate our street. We know that it's a complex problem, problem and that we need to have longer term solutions in place. So medium term, we want to have a look at better infrastructure on the street, more trees, make it much more um, attractive to people. And then longer term, we need to get more people living, working, recreating in our town centre. So, you know, we can look at the parts of the town that we have control over to try and encourage some more development there. And we're hoping that there'll be a flow-on effect to the other, the private landowners in the town who can then potentially develop their properties to make it a more vibrant, attractive place for people. So as part of the Vibrancy Project, you might have seen that we're also breaking out the town teams concept here in Bassendean. If, it's, if you haven't heard of this concept yet, town teams are positive, proactive organisations that include businesses, landowners and residents, all working collaboratively with their local government to improve their place. So town teams are contributing to vibrancy in a lot of the places in Perth where there are fun and exciting things happening. So if you've been into Leaderville or Mount Hawthorne, um, Vic Park, all of those places have got town, team town teams operating and they're contributing to the vibrancy that those areas are experiencing. So we know that there are many people in the town of Bassendean who want to be involved um, and who want to make a difference. So the town teams is a real opportunity for people to be able to, to get involved, to be creative and help to bring some of that vibrancy to our town centre. Next Monday night, um, Dean Cracknell, who's the CEO of the Town Teams Movement, will be here with us um, up the road and he's going to be introducing Town Teams concept and that'll be an opportunity for you to get involved and to really be part of what's happening. Um, our urban forests. So many of us are really passionate about trees. One of the beautiful things about Bassendean is that we have mature old trees, that it's green and it's leafy. But we're also aware that there is development, there are trees that are being knocked down on development sites and you know, our, our world is getting hotter. So we really want to have a focus on greening Bassendean. Um, Council has recently set a target of having 70% canopy coverage on our road reserves. Um, so that will guide the kind of trees that we plant and also the spacing of them so that we can achieve that kind of coverage. Um, we have a vision of having our streets be much more cool and leafy. Um, and to achieve that, we also need to have the staff on board. So we're looking at employing an urban forest officer very soon to help us to achieve the success of this program, but also to help us to engage with the community because it's something that we want the community to also have ownership of and um, for people to have more appreciation of the value of trees. Um, we're planning on initially focusing our tree planting on the areas of our town that have underground power, so Ashfield and those parts of Eden Hill that already have underground power, because that will allow us to plant larger trees um, that can provide that canopy um, and that won't be limited by the height of the power lines and need you know, excessive amounts of pruning. Um, we're also looking at ways to engage the community, so we're looking at tree planting days, um, those kind of things, so that people can really get involved and it becomes not just a council thing, but it's something that we all have ownership of. Um, community safety is something that has been an issue raised recently. Um, there was a spate of burglaries on Old Perth Road that really brought this to the fore recently. Um, and it was a good trigger to again revisit the conversation about community safety and crime prevention. So this year we're planning on getting the community together with police, with the local government, with business owners and residents to have a look at how all together we can have a plan for community safety. We don't want it to be a focus just on um, negative and putting up lots of security screens and so on, but what can we do as a community to be more connected and to make sure that our town is a safe place for everybody? Um, our emissions reduction plan. So this is something that we're in the process of developing. Um, we know that our community is passionate about sustainability, so we want to set an ambitious target for our um, emissions reduction because we want to be responsible stewards of our environment. Um, there have been some initiatives already that we've been working on, but we're really looking forward to having some, um, some creative and some innovative ways that we can deliver better sustainability um, outcomes for our town. Um, we're also building a really strong relationship with the Curtin, Unici Curtin University Sustainability Policy Institute, or CUSP, and that's a relationship that we want to continue to nurture because there's all sorts of opportunities that would come out of forming those connections um, with organisations like this. Um, community engagement framework. So we really want to rethink the way that the town communicates. Um, there hasn't been a lot of priority given to this in the past and it's something that we really value and that we want to put more emphasis on. Um, so 
as a town, we're working on a new community engagement framework, and this is the mechanism that we plan to use to ensure that everybody has a say on matters that are important to them. And Peter will speak to this a little bit more um, when she comes up to speak. But this leads on to the strategic town planning and the vision for the future. This, so this is probably the most, um, the most significant project for the next 12 months. Um, it's the most important undertaking um, for us as a community because this is the way that we're going to shape our community, um, not just for the next few years, but for potentially coming decades. So not just for us, but for our children as well. Um, so together we have the opportunity to shape Bassendean to be the place that we want it to be for the future. Um, so tonight I am, I'm really pleased that we have um, creating communities who have been appointed the role of assisting us with engaging with our community to develop our vision for the town of Bassendean into the future. Um, they've been selected to assist us with developing a master plan um, to guide the growth and development of the town of Bassendean for future generations. So they'll be designing the strategy that will deliver the vision for our future, um, for the future of Bassendean. And we'll also be working with Audric, which is Perth's Australian Urban Design Research Centre, as part of this process. So tonight we have a couple of the representatives from creating, creating communities um, with us tonight. And so I'd love to introduce them to you and give them the opportunity to just share a little bit about what they're planning on doing with the town. So I'm not sure where Alan and jo oh, Alan, Joseph, please come and join us. Welcome. Yeah, you may as well come up here and speak to us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've just got three quick things to say. And the first thing is, and that's a really important thing, being connected, and it's one of the things which is falling to bits in our, community, in our society at the moment, being connected. The second thing is that um, I was born in Midland and raised in Midvale, and we had hope. All the kids that I went to school with wanted to be part of that apprenticeship, nothing else. So my second point is this. Linked with the first bit about what we're passionate about, you need to be connected to your character and spirit. So what's the character and spirit of Bassendine that you want to see go forward into the future? But just like that story I've told you, things are really different than they were 30 and 40 years ago as far as employment's concerned as far as ageing in place is concerned, as far as retail is done, just, just do it online, as far as how main streets work, how ageing in place happens, how education happens. And so we have to be able to translate that character and spirit that we all love into the present age. And the age will continue to change. And if you think it's just about those things that I've mentioned, this last week there was a funeral of one of the icons of this area, in my view, fiery Freddie Castledine, and there were 600 people at the funeral. I used to catch the train in Midland and come, when I was 11 years old, down to bat, off at success and watch the footy. The CEO of, of the Swan Districts Football Club is here tonight, Jeff Dennis. He, he, if you want to ask him, he will tell you that he's transforming the way that a football club operates so that it can be successful into the future while hanging on to its character and spirit. So rather than just being about footy, it's being about a community connector, a community agent. So character and spirit, making sure we're relevant to today and in a changing society. And then the third bit as we go through this local planning strategy is that it, it must involve as many people as possible from the town of Bassendean. And I'm talking about older pe people, I'm talking about kids, Aboriginal folk, people who've been here for a couple of generations. I used to go swimming down at um, Sandy Beach when I was six and seven years old. But so the people who've lived here all that time, the people who are moving in, as the mayor said, there's a regeneration of younger families coming in here. We must be able to figure out ways to engage them all. As a company, we're used to doing that. In Headland recently, we did their community strategy and engaged over 5,800 people out of 15,000 people. Um, so. We want to engage in as many different ways as is possible with you guys, and we want you to come back time after time after time to build the ideas as you go. Because our job is to listen, to understand, and to translate that into the, the way forward as far as this local planning strategy is concerned. We'll use a whole heap of different techniques, but we really encourage you to come yourself, but to bring others as well. Thanks, 
Cal, and I'm really excited to have you and Joseph and the rest of your team working with the town. I think there's really fantastic opportunities ahead, and I love what you talked about, about char character and spirit. It's really important. And you're a Governor Sterling boy, so you must be a good guy. <laughs> um, oh, I don't think we had a song when we were there. <laughs> So I think um, it's really clear that all of us in this room love Bassendine. Um, we want our kids to grow up in a community where it's healthy and people are connected and there's a strong sense of well-being and happiness. And that's what we want to work together um, towards in partnership with all of you and those who aren't here tonight. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight and for the privilege of being the Mayor. It's been a, a big challenge and there's been lots of obstacles, but I think that we're on a really positive path now and that the year ahead's going to be a fantastic one for the town of Bassendine. I'm really excited about it and I hope that there's excitement in the community as well because we have a really special thing here and we have the opportunity to make it even better. So with that now I'd like to invite um, Peter Mads to come up and speak to you. Um, so Peter joined the town in October. She's only been with us three months but in that period of time she's already made some really significant changes in the town. Um, she's been working really tirelessly on our behalf. Um, I don't think anybody could work harder than Peter has been working for us. And I know that when we were going through the recruitment process looking for a new CEO, I was absolutely delighted when we met Peter. Um, but having the opportunity to work with her every day, I continue to be more and more amazed at um, what she brings to our town. So please welcome Peter to come and share with us now. nice isn't she <laughs> um yeah so thanks again peter for all your incredible efforts on behalf of the town you know we have a fantastic group of councillors who are all have put their hand up for this role so that they can invest in their community and really see it to move forward and i know peter and our staff as well have the best interests of our town at heart and so i think there's so much opportunity ahead of us it's really exciting there are obviously lots of things for us to still achieve in the town, but I just want us to take a minute now to, to watch our latest short video that is really an opportunity to celebrate some of the really good things that we already have here in Bassendine. I'm just keeping you in suspense. No pressure, Ken. <laughs> I think the community at the moment is on a little bit of a tipping point where there's been a lot of focus on what the community has already had, but actually at the moment we're really thinking about actually how uh, the community can move forward. It's a really diverse community, a lot of opportunities for people to actually be involved. No, 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 that's been moved over here. I've loved it here, the community spirit. I can't think of anywhere else I'd rather have a business the people that make Bassendine and I just feel like I'm part of something, I'm part of the bigger picture. I feel very engaged living in this area. I love a lot of the events are free, the community events. We have Anzac Day ceremony which is really beautiful. We've got NAIDOC week, the fireworks. And what I love about this community as well is that we're so close to nature and lots of things are outdoors. Over the last few years, with a lot of infill uh, in the town, things have changed dramatically. It's now a very vibrant uh, community. Our community is really passionate about sustainability. 
we're one of the first councils in Western Australia to introduce a food organics and garden organics bin and this will help divert a large quantity of waste from landfill. It's kind of a peaceful uh, place to come in, into the bush um, away from the hustle and bustle of daily life to come down here and enjoy it. The service has definitely changed my life, otherwise yes, I have to get taxis or go on public transport and things like that, which is very difficult sometimes, so it has changed my life and made my life much, much easier. We want to be a council that's not just working for our community, but we want to work with our community. So we want to empower people to be able to make this place something that they're proud of. Oh look, I'm really excited. I think we've got so much potential. We've got opportunities in the pipeline and prospects. We've got an, a really committed community to work with. So I think the future is looking really bright for Bess and Dean. Thanks, Ken. So I think we all know we've got lots to celebrate here in Bass and Dean, but there's also lots um, for us to look forward to and lots to be excited about. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, Nella's here tonight. Um, something to be excited about is the Wonder Realm Festival that we'll have in our main street. That's the 15th to the 17th, is that right, Nella? That's going to be fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I do think we've got a really bright future if we all work on this together. So, moving on to the, um, the boring part of the meeting, we have to receive the annual report. Um, so, we have the annual report available in hard copy over here. We also have it available online. Um, but one of, the, one of the functions of an annual general meeting is for the community to receive the annual report. And basically that means that we've made it available to you to look at. We don't expect people to have had the opportunity to look through it in detail. Um, but if you have questions about it after you've had a look at it, feel free to contact myself, staff, councillors. We will all be very happy to speak to you about what's in, the, in that document. Um, but right at this point in time, I need to have a mover to receive the annual report. Jerry Pure, thank you. And a seconder. Yeah, I'd like to ask a oh, sorry, Mr. Yates. Yes, you're welcome to ask a question. Um, we can ask questions about the annual report at during question time. All we're doing is receiving it at the moment, Mr. Yates. Okay, uh, Mr. Yates. Mr. Yates, all we're doing is receiving it at this point. As I said, it's just purely that you have received the report to look at and to have comment on. So I, I totally take your point, but we, we'll move on to questions in just a minute. So, okay. So Mr. Pule has moved it. Do we have a seconder to receive it, Mrs. Siddell? Um, we have someone against. Um, anybody else against? All those in favour? Sorry, Mr. Wood. And all those in favour? So that is passed with two dissenters. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to general business. So some of you might be aware that this year we asked people to submit questions in advance. Um, don't worry if you didn't submit your question in advance. We're still going to uh, attempt to respond to your questions tonight. But we did want to give the staff an opportunity to um, have time to prepare answers for any questions that may have been more complicated. So we received a number of questions and I'll just go through those now and then we'll give um, open the meeting up to give the opportunity for others to ask questions. Um, so we received a question from Mr Trevor Barker. Is Trevor here this evening? No, I'll, I'll still address the question. So his question was um, inquiring about whether, whether a seat could be provided on Old Perth Road for the many people who reside in the ages homes on both sides of Hamilton Street. So it's a good suggestion and there was a seat that was planned for that particular location. However, in the interim we received a development application for a new ages facility on the old um, car sales site on Old Perth Road um, and that development would impact on the location of the seat. So the application has now been approved by JDAP and once that um, development is being built we'll then be able to look at where the most appropriate place to put that seat is so that it doesn't um, interact with the building. Um, we also received a question from Mrs Anne Tierney. I don't believe Anne is here tonight either. Um, her inquiry related to what plans Council has for Ashfield in terms of street scrape, streetscape upgrades. Um, so I may have mentioned earlier that this year the town budgeted to increase the number of street trees that we were planting um, threefold. 
Um, and I also mentioned that we were planning on prioritising Ashfield and parts of Eden Hill where the underground power has already been installed um, and our engagement process about tree planting. Over the past two years, there's been 370 street trees that have been planted in Ashfield and we've been working with community groups, including Ashcan, around that tree planting. And there is also currently a plan in place to have a new lookout over the Ashfield flats that the town is working in partnership with Ashcan on. Um, Mr Yates, so Mr Yates um, had quite a series of questions that he put to the town and um, in discussion with him, um, he was very gracious and agreed to just prioritise his questions. The other questions that Mr Yates has proposed um, will be answered and they will be recorded in the minutes so that they are publicly available. Um, but the main question that Mr Yates wanted to ask was about um, what the town was doing to build trust, um, the trust of the community. Um, and I think it's important in answering that question to acknowledge that in the past there has been some trust issues with the community um, that have, and some of the actions of the town that have fostered that distrust. And this is something that we're really actively trying to remedy and rebuild. Um, I feel like many of the initiatives that we've touched on tonight already, the things that Peter spoke about, are attempting to address that trust. Um, we're really committed to checking in with the community before we proceed with plans um, so that we're really confident that when we go ahead with something, it is reflective of what the community wants um, and that you know, the community is embracing of whatever direction that we are setting. Um, it, the town embracing the town team's concept is an example of the way that we want to, to build trust with the community so that we can hear what people want and support the community in the initiatives that they want to see happen. Um, we also, it's a reflection as well of moving away from having the top-down approach where everything is driven from above, but shifting that focus so that things can really be driven by the local community. Um, I think Peter spoke as well about putting processes in place so that we're not just focusing on compliance with things, but we're wanting to, to aim for best practice. And so hopefully all of those things, as they start to become more developed, will help the community to begin to trust um, where there has been distrust in the past. Uh, a further question was from Mr Adam Grigsfall. Is Adam here? So his question related to um, the status of the building... Br the br sorry, let me start that again. The status of the investigation into building a bridge across the Swan River to connect Bassendine with Belmont. So Mr Grigsfall was referring to a proposal that I believe was put forward by Mr Jerry Puel when he was on council a number of years back. And the previous council supported investigating the proposal at the time. So the proposal was to link Ashfield to Garvey Park in Belmont with a pedestrian bridge. So in alignment with the council resolution, um, the officers of the town have liaised with the city of Belmont. And although there was some interest in the proposal, it wasn't a priority at the time. So that hasn't been progressed any further. Um, we also have a question from Mr Roy Shearer, who is here tonight because I met him this evening. Thank you, Roy. Um, so his question related to what the main focus will be for council in 2019 and I hope that some of what we've presented tonight already will have um, given some insight into that but um, as I alluded to earlier that the really key focus this year is around the community engagement strategy that creating communities will be assisting us with. It's really important to us that we get um, a clear idea about what the community's vision is for our town and we start working towards that together. Um, then there's all of the organisational reforms that Peter referred to that would allow us to have that solid foundation to allow us to deliver the things that we want to deliver. So reorientation, policy review, workforce review, um, community engagement, and then practically things like our new waste strategy, the town teams, um, the men's shared development, all of those um, initiatives that I mentioned earlier. So Mr Shear, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where you're sitting. I th was there anything further you wanted me to address at this point? Thank you. And finally, a question from Mr Bruce Kay. I saw Bruce earlier. Now, I appreciate that you have, you're a man of your word. Mr Kay promised that every year he would ask us about <laughs> town planning scheme 4A, and you have. So Mr Kay's question um, was twofold. So firstly, it was, what are the agreed actions were completed for the closure of town planning scheme 4A in 2018? And secondly, what actions are to be achieved for the closure of Town Planning Scheme 4A in 2019? So in order for the town to finalise the scheme, it would mean us purchasing six privately owned lots. Um, the cost of this was previously estimated to be about $2.8 million. Um, 
In this financial year, in the previous one, there were no agreed actions um, towards closure of that town planning scheme um, in the town's corporate business plan because it wasn't considered a priority at this time. Um, now, Mr Kay, obviously this is an issue that um, is important to you, so I think maybe it would be good if we could sit down, yourself, myself and some of the staff, and we could have a discussion around some of your concerns so that we can fully appreciate what it is um, that you're worried about in terms of town planning scheme 4A, if you're agreeable to that. That would be wonderful. Yeah, th thank you. So in a moment what we'll do is we'll move on to general questions and then I'll encourage people to come up to the front. So um, thank you, Mr Kay, and yeah, maybe we can organise a time soon to have some more conversation around that. Um, so as I just said, so what we'll do now is we'll move on to general business. Um, even if you have just thought of your question tonight, that's perfectly fine. We really encourage you to come and ask it, but also share any ideas or thoughts that you have. Um, many of you are familiar with how this you know, part of a meeting works, but just in case you're not, I'll just make it clear so that everybody's comfortable. So if you do have something that you'd like to say, if you could just raise your hand, and when I um, indicate to you, it'd be great if you could come forward to the microphone and speak there so that everybody can hear what you're saying. Um, when you do come up, it's important that you tell us your name and also your address, or at least your street, the street that you live on in the town. Um, if you can direct the questions to me, so even if it's something that you know specifically one of the staff will need to answer, we can direct um, it, your question to that person. Um, what else do I need to tell you? If your question can't be answered tonight because the staff don't have the, all of the necessary information on hand, we will make sure that you get a comprehensive answer provided to you um, and that will also be included in the minutes so that everybody has access to that information. Um, there may be lots of people that want to ask questions, which would be great. Um, so in that case, can I ask you to limit your questions to two at a time to start with and then give somebody else the opportunity to speak? And if you know, time permits, then of course you can come and ask further questions after everybody else has had the opportunity um, to have their say. So, Mr Yates, you've got your hand up. Oh, sorry, while Mr Yates is coming up as well, I just need to bring everyone's attention to the fact that our meeting is live streamed, so it's uploaded to the internet, so you will be recorded and anything you're saying is publicly available. We don't do that to be intimidating, we do it because we want to make um, our meetings accessible to the community and we want people who aren't able to attend tonight to be able to hear what's going on. So just so that you're aware before you come and say things that you may otherwise not have, um, have said, but um, Mr Yates, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Don Yates, Team Thompson Road, in Successville. Uh, two quick questions, if I may. The, uh, it, the first two questions relate to the annual figures for the town. Um, is the uh, Lord Street Bridge value of around about $9 million included in the figures? Yeah. Is the, the town owns the Lord Street Bridge decking, doesn't own the uprights. Mm. Is the value of that included in the town's annual figures? The, the bridge is not included in the town's asset. It's not the town's asset. Uh, I beg to differ. It actually is listed as a town asset. It also, uh, according to Main Roads, uh, it also, I think, lacks insurance coverage and it lacks third-party risk coverage. I think the town needs to closely investigate the ownership and the legal responsibilities, insurance responsibilities, replacement value of the Lord Street Bridge. Um, Mr Simon Stewart Dawkins had this question so, asked so of him last Yates. October. Mr Yates, um, so just for everybody else's benefit, Mr Yates has raised um, the issue of the Lord Street Bridge and so the main structure of the bridge is th under the ownership of the main roads, is that correct? And it's just the surface of the road that is under the town's um, ownership. Yes, That's just, 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 
excuse me, sorry, yeah, it's just the surface of the road. There's mm. a there's an in interrail agreement that the town of Assendine signed um, a couple of years ago, and um, we have responsibility in regards to the asphalt surface, the sweeping of that, and maintenance of that of mm. that road surface. For the actual bridge structure, that that's not our responsibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, could I actually have that in writing? Because according to Main yep. Roads, no the upright pylons are owned by Main Roads. The top decking complete is owned by the so town of Assendine. Mr. Yates, obviously With there's some. Some yeah, okay. Of uh, just, just, just hold on a moment. Just let me continue to speak. So maybe in the minutes um, we could include the the information that were provided to us about the ownership for Mr. Yates. That would be wonderful. Thank you. And the second question. And the second question relates to TPS 4A. It's coming up to its 40th birthday. I think it needs to be separately listed in the annual records of financial records of the town. As Mr. Bruce Kay points out, this has been an ongoing sore of more than 40 years. If you look at some of the planning issues, the state planning rules say you should only have two, I mean, only have one planning, local planning scheme liable or, uh, alive at any one time. We have two. Uh, I think that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bridges. Thanks, Renee. Um, Paul Bridges, 150 West Road, Bassendine. Um, I'd like to follow up on the, uh, the character and spirit comments that was made. Um, when the community strategic plan was drawn up, the, um, the, pe the good people of the town of Assendine identified uh, as the priority one as green open space and priority two, maintaining the character of the town. Now, in the last few years, the, this town's reviewed its municipal heritage inventory um, and it was a community-based committee. Uh, consultants were brought in um, and a plan was drawn up and in May last year, the council um, carried a resolution uh, to give protection to 48 properties in the, uh, uh, within the town, within the town planning scheme. So that was May last year. Um, now, I followed the directions and came early and had a couple of snaggers and directed the question at Mr. Reid. Um, and my question was, when are those uh, 48 um, properties going to be included in the town planning scheme and given protection. And he said, oh, in the next month or two. Okay, well, that, that's fine. I hope that happens. Because when the town's first uh, municipal uh, um, heritage inventory was drawn up, there were 10 properties that were supposed to be given protection under the town planning scheme. That never happened. Um, and I, as the chairman of the committee, would be really disappointed if this was just let, left drift. Now. At that May meeting... Mr Bridges, can I just... So, Mr Reid, was there anything else you wanted to add in response to that question? I've, I've given a commitment to, to Mr Bridges. I've to let him know more yeah. information than he needed that I'm away for the next month or the next three weeks. <laughs> and it's a priority when I come back, so realistically, it should be done within two months. Yeah. Uh, thank and, you. And, and thank you for that. The, um, the other part of, of my... my and, and, and you'd answered that question, and I was happy with that. This was background to what I'm leading to. In the same motion, um, $10,000 was, was, was recommended to be allocated in the budget, which subsequently occurred, um, to draw up the heritage incentives. Um, and also in the same motion, $30,000 was allocated um, to, to do prepare heritage um, precinct guidelines. Now, in asking Mr Reid when they were likely to happen, he said, oh, it's possible that they will be deferred and will not happen in this financial year. Now, I find that really disappointing because all it takes is um, for briefs for quotes to be drawn up for, the, for those two things. And in the same way as the new CEO, and I'm very pleased that she's on deck, um, talked about you know, it was really important that the, you know, the efforts of council and of staff align and, um, and that they be appropriately resourced. Now, in this case, they have been appropriately resourced by council. Um, and so my question is, is it the intention of you, know, you, you, the mayor, and the CEO, to pursue the completion um, of those two parts of the project within this financial year, as directed by council and the resources allocated by council? Thank you. So the first thing I'd like to say about that is we've been having some discussions at the moment because we're at the stage where we're doing our mid-year review, having a look at what the priorities are and what realistically can be achieved in the next six months before the end of the financial year. Um, 
that process and hasn't come to its conclusion yet. So I can't tell you categori categorically which things we're saying, yes, this absolutely has to happen before the end of the financial year and which things may get put off. So that discussion is still ongoing. Um, Mr Reid, are you able to comment on what would be required for us to be able to complete this work by the end of the financial year as Mr Bridges' um, preference? Um, it, it would be on my part to develop in a brief of both studies and engaging consultants then to finish the task. So I suppose it is realistic. I've explained earlier on that we've not been able to get to this project earlier and potentially it's two of the projects that could be revisited by council in terms of re-establishing its priorities going forward. But once a decision is made by council as to whether or not it happens this year, it'll then be implemented. Well, you know, the council has directed staff to, to follow that out and provide it with resources. And if we are to, you know, genuinely, if you genuinely want to build trust and support with the community, um, it's very important that those two features al align. Anyway, thank you and my compliments to both yourself and the CEO. Thank you. Yes, sorry. daunting of working your way up there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Pat Carpwitz and I'm from Hobley Place, Eden Hill. Um, in the last couple of years, I've noticed that there's been a bit of an increase in rat population in the area. Um, North Bassendean in Eden Hill certainly has a number of open drains, which when the subdivision was put through in 75-76, it was said that those drains would be enclosed. I mean, we're now in 2019 and we still have open drains mm. and I feel that a lot of the um, rats are probably nesting in these drains. Is there anything in the horizon? So I'll ask Mr Reid in a moment to speak about the um, environmental health side of things, but in terms of their drains being enclosed, there's been more movement towards converting drains rather than enclosing them and turning them into living streams. And that's certainly something that the town has expressed interest in pursuing. Um, we, have, we have yet to convert any, but we've put in expressions of interest to Water Corp about drains that we would like to have some transformation of to make them yeah. much healthier spaces and also spaces that our community can enjoy. Um, so that's kind of what's on the horizon in terms of our thinking about the future of those drains. But Mr Reid, are you the appropriate person to comment on the rats issue? Uh, I suppose the way the town works is we, you probably all know, issue free rat bait. We monitor where that's going to. And when the health officers identify problems in the areas, they generally then go and investigate further in those areas. But I'll ask one of the health officers to look at Hobley Place. And do are the drains commonly a site that have been problematic? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'm sure Mr Reid will be able to follow up on that for us and provide us with some further information. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr Siddell. Hi, I'm Carol Seidel from 55 Broadway, Bassendean. I have a serious question to ask and it's our disappearing bus shelters that we are seeing being removed here in Bassendean. Uh, I've noticed them especially over on the other side of the railway line. Um, I think it's really bad that we're not providing shelter during the day when people go to those bus stops and especially in the summer in the heat, you know, let's get more cancer uh, <laughs> melanoma is happening and also in winter when it rains. And I want to know when we are going to see where those bus shelters have been removed, when they are going to be replaced. I understand the state government do put funding towards those bus shelters and I think it's a high priority for the town of Assenine to look at it. So, I, so I'm sorry, I thought yeah. you finished. I didn't mean to um, One thing that really disturbed me is to see a little old lady that I know lives down the street, goes to a bus stop in on Broadway up near um, Ida Street, not Ida Street, um, Penzance, and sits on the curb, you know, because we used to have a bus shelter there. 
A lot of the bus shelters, even if they're just on one side of the road, people will use them when they hear the bus coming, they'll cross over the other side of the road to catch the bus. Yeah. So we don't have to have bus shelters on either side of the road. But I think we need to get them back and I would like to see that happen. So just a bit of a background on the bus shelters because you know, you're right, we're trying to encourage people to be out, to be active, to use public transport, mm. but there has been a reduction in the number of bus shelters and staff, please correct me if I'm saying something out of line. My understanding is that um, there were a number of bus shelters in the town that were non-compliant with disability access and so then there was a requirement to have them removed. But that's not a good excuse. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. So this, is, this was the state government's requirement. It was not the town of oh. Bassendean's requirement. So we, our preference would be to keep those shelters so that the people who are accessing them can continue to use them. But that was not a decision that was ours to make. Then in terms of replacing the bus shelters, um, the state government has a minimum usage that is um, what determines whether they're going to assist funding a bus shelter. So the situation that we've been left in is that the state government has required us to remove functional bus shelters that a wheelchair can't access but others can, yet we're not eligible to have assistance to replace them. Am I speaking correctly? Yeah. So. Pardon? So it's an issue that you might want to take up with your state member? Well, I think I have brought it up with the state member and I do know that the state member gets lots of um, uh, residents coming in or constituents yeah. complaining about the disappearing no, I, bus shelters. I, I appreciate that. But also from the town's perspective, we are then, if we're going to have to completely fund bus shelters because the state government has imposed this upon us, that's not an ideal situation for us as ratepayers. So it's something that we need to work in partnership with the state government, but the removal is not something that we have supported. Well, you just think about there's a bus shelter on Reed Street that's got a fantastic mural on mm. it with a lovely smiley face. It must make people happy to go to work. Now, that bus shelter technically under what you're talking about would be removed yeah, and yet it's, it's a great compliant. bus shelter yeah. and you know there was one in Walter Road uh, near um, uh, look at uh, another example is the one outside of the Hydra Retirement Village yeah. as well yeah. so we've been in contact with the residents there for quite some time because they're a, a population that really do benefit from having a bus shelter that often don't drive. Mm. Um, but the situation we had was that the bus shelters didn't fit in the space that was allocated. So I think just recently we've come to a um, solution where, where, where does the bus shelter come from? The one that we're going to be putting there. Um, actually, what we're looking at potentially doing is is working with the Hyde Retirement Village to put a, a, a some type of um, like a pergola or shelter onto on their, their private property, mm. which they, they then will have a seat under it, which yeah. uh, they have indicated would be uh, yeah. okay for them. So that's where we're at at the moment. So but we've still got to get some yeah. quotes and look at prices for them. So, Carol, we are, we're concerned about this as well. Yeah. And, for example, we're working with that group to find a solution for yeah. them. But it's definitely something that we need to be working with the state government representatives on to get the best outcome. Well, when you see, when you go down Guildford Road... Um, then becomes uh, the main part of Guildford, you have to go past
good proceeding any further. So that's when um, Peter came on board, we've had those discussions and that has led to us prioritising um, yeah, this project. But we still want you, Moss. <laughs> Don't disappear. Is there anybody else first before Mr Bridges asks again? Mr Kay? Thank you, Your Worship. Bruce Kay, 11 Earls Ferry Court, Bassendine. My question relates to the LPS 10 scheme amendment and uh, I was one of those who lobbied council at the time to adopt a three-year program to complete the amendment, uh, which included appointing a strategic planner to do it. And that, that was adopted by council resolution in May 2016. So I'm looking for the amendment to be completed in May 2019. Yet there's been some comment uh, on the website now saying that uh, Council's considering obtaining a facility somewhere on Old Perth Road where a display is going to be put up for the public to see. Uh, and that's not going to happen until October, according to that information. Um, the second thing about that is Council hasn't been brave enough, may I say, to pick one scheme, but has nominated two schemes to come back to the people. So it sounds to me like we have just blown three years. We've done some work in between, traffic studies and forecasts and stuff, which is all good, but we haven't gone anywhere. So my challenge to you, Mayor, and the Council, I believe you should have selected one scheme that you thought was the best to put it forward for consultation. The consultation would have done little tweaking and we would have got there. So just so to clarify, when you say one scheme, you're talking about those density scenarios? Density Is that what scenarios, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. for years we all worked along the fact that we were going to do things around the railway station and density along the railway line. A lot of people came to accept that was a reasonable place for it to occur because of the railway and so on. Uh, and now it's into other areas and I'm sure there's some people who have strong opinions about some of those things. I'll invite um, Peter to speak to your question in, in a moment. Um, but I'd just like to make a couple of comments po first. Um, I don't disagree with you. Um, there was a plan to deliver the scheme amendment, so a new local planning scheme in a three-year time frame. And you're right, that won't be completed in the anticipated time frame. Um, your point about putting out the density scenarios, there had been work done on various density scenarios that could accommodate the infill target that the state government had proposed for the town of Bassendine. So the, the state government's requiring us to have an additional 4,150 dwellings as part of their um, Perth and Peel at 3.5 million by the year 2050. Um, so the town had done some work on developing various scenarios about how we could accommodate that increased population within the town. Um, but it came back to needing the community to own the vision. And there are people like yourself who are very engaged, who understand a lot about planning, um, who appreciate the complexities and the need to have higher density around our town centres and so on. But I think um, that's not representative of where the majority of our community are at. And if we learn anything from the Landcorp, um, um, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, debacle, <laughs> Um, it was that we needed the community to understand um, what we were doing um, and be on board with it and to have had a say in that process. So you are correct, we could have put out three density scenarios, asked the community to have their say and the majority of people probably wouldn't have been interested because it was a very dry topic, it didn't allow people to understand what that actually represented and ultimately we may have ended up in the same situation that we were in a few years ago where all of a sudden the community were very upset because all of these changes were going to be happening around them that they didn't understand. So it is unfortunate that the timing has been pushed out, I don't disagree with that, but I think ultimately we'll get a much better outcome if we just slow down a little bit, have the opportunity to you know, embrace the expertise that people like um, creating communities are bringing to us and get the community really to be involved, empowered and deliver a vision that all of us can own. Did you want to say anything? Yeah. I, hello, Mr Kay. How are you? <laughs> nice Good. to see you. Yeah. Um, the shop front on Old Perth Road, I think, was something that you mentioned and it was a proposal that went up as part of the community engagement uh, strategy that we were proposing, I think, uh, late last year. So um, essentially we talked about going out and getting a quote 
from a number of uh, suppliers who have selected uh, creating communities. Now, part of that strategy was to create a bit of a community hub, so somewhere where the community could actually come <coughs> and have a conversation about the type of community they would like to see in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Yes, some of that's about density, but it's also about amenity, it's about the environment, you know, it, it's so much more. And also for people to be able to visually see what that might look like um, is really important. So we talked about creating a, um, a point that's accessible for everybody to come in, have a conversation. We'd have councillors available that could talk to community members. Creating communities would be available and our, our staff as well. So that was part of the strategy. Um, I guess I arrived and I think my second day was a council meeting when the density scenarios were being put up and uh, it just seemed like an opportunity to rethink what that conversation might look like with the community. Do we want to go out and start talking about our codes or do we actually want to have a conversation that was more about, you know, what is it the, the sort of community you would like to see in the next 5, 10, 15 years? So um, that's why I guess there's been a bit of a shift. Um, I'm ha happy to say that I, I've sort of been part of that. So, um, But there has been some fantastic work that's gone on in the background around transport study, um, design guidelines, etc., that will contribute to this um, work that we'll be doing over the next few months. And I hope by October we have a really strong vision for what we want this future town to be. And I actually think this stage it might seem like we're going slow, but I think it's going to enable us to go fast um, beyond October um, to finalise the local planning strategy scheme, etc. cetera. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter, for that. Um, I've known for, from my professional life, I know creating com communities and I believe them to be very good. I don't have any doubt they'll achieve what they're setting out to do. But they won't achieve anything if council doesn't decide something for them to achieve. Um, I can go back to 2008. Um, councillors have been worried about activation in Old Firth Road. In 2008, we had a, a scheme that was almost adopted by council for Old Firth Road and the, and the city centre, and it, it was carefully done by Hame Sharley. In my opinion, it was a pretty good effort. It disappeared. Mm. Ten years later, we're now going to spend another 12 months. I think council doesn't remember that it comes back to land use and land use zoning. So if people along Old Firth Road aren't going to invest money in anything unless the land use is reasonably certain for them in a commercial sense. There are a lot of old folk in our community who own land all around the community who would potentially benefit by an increase in their asset value if the higher densities were through certain areas. Mm. So I think council in not acting is actually shorting a lot of residents out of some asset, particularly uh, the older people who want the asset to either move on to other care or do whatever they want to do with it. So I, I've got to again urge council to make some decisions and keep the pedal on the metal, otherwise we'll be here in 12 months time going nowhere. And I know that after the consultation council has to adopt it and it has to go to the WAPC for sign off and a whole process there, so all that takes time. The original three-year program had those time frames all in it. So all I can do is express uh, my dissatisfaction that again, we're becoming a town that does nothing. Um, can I, <laughs> as a retired civil engineer, can I just make a few comments to Carol Siegel's comments about flood risk? Sure. A lot of people don't understand flood risk and how it's derived. Um, the, the, one in, the old one in a hundred risk came out of a flood in Brisbane in 1972 where there was a big debate among insurers about what was a storm. And so the insurer said, we'll accept a 1% risk. So everyone sat down and did analysis everywhere to try and work out what was a 1% risk. The design book is written, rewritten two or three years ago with a lot more rainfall data, so it's a lot better document and produces a lot better outcomes. And it, it's not called average recurrence interval anymore, it's called annual exceedance probability. 
So a 1% would come out as a 1% annual exceedance probability. It doesn't mean that it will never be exceeded. In fact, it could be exceeded a couple of times a year if the weather changed. So it is a reasonable risk between insurance and building council. So there will always be floods that will always flood places. And hopefully, hopefully the new flood heights are going to be put in, I'm told, to the correct level, the new correct level. So thank you, Your Honour. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Mr Bridges and then Mr Yates. And then if, is there anybody else who wishes to ask a question first? Okay, um, uh, sorry, Paul Bridges, 150 West Road. Um, my, my question relates to the closure of the 4A scheme and uh, I move the motion on council that um, you know, that be proceeded with. I totally understand the reason why this council's deferred that because there are a, a, you know, there's a couple of million dollars worth of purchases that need to be made. That's a two-part question. My first one is related to the land swap with uh, Mr Jess Jeff Herbert, who has since deceased in the time that this has taken to occur. Um, the land for the swap has been prepared and my question is, can I have a status report on the land swap, please? Most of the, I suppose the earthworks in the Rotating Mall has, has been done. We're now in the process of getting the subdivision clearance. And I think as part of that process, we might, uh, we, we were required to put another electricity supply into the adjoining lot. So realistically, that process, the subdivision, the, the land should be created and fit and ready for swapping within about two, two and a half months. So th by the conclusion of this financial year? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, the second part of my question, and this should be of interest to councillors, um, the, the, the land which was swapped from with, from Mr. with Mr Herbert for the, the newly created lot um, is zoned as, uh, as residential land. Uh, I do notice in the plans that Mr Dowling draws up that he always has it green as public open space. Um, there's a motion uh, that sits on the book, books for council that la that land can be sold um, to anyone that can provide access off Watson Street. Now there's a family called the Kapenskis that own two lots um, that front on to Watson Street and behind them they lo own two long blocks within the 4A scheme that the town is obliged to purchase. Now my understanding is that the... Um, Henry Kapensky wrote to council, uh, and councillors may not know about this, uh, in May of last year, um, offering to swap their two long legs um, of land for, for, the, for the, um, the Herbert land, which is immediately adjacent to the little parcel that they own. They can provide access off Watson Street, and if that lands, if once the Herbert land swap's done, and council owns Mr. P you know, Mr. Herbert deceased's um, block, then there is no reason why that land swap can't go ahead and save the council probably a million dollars um, by doing a straight swap for their two long legs um, and giving them a, use a, a larger usable parcel of land which they can provide access to. Now, my question is, has this council been informed of the offer by Mr. Kapensky to do that land swap, and if not, why not? My hazy recollection is that the, the former CEO was certainly aware of, of the proposed land swap, and I think the mayor was, in, was advised of it as well. I have written to Mr. Kapinski and, and basically said that I would support a proposal for a land swap once that land yet once 27 Highland Street is within our ownership. It, we don't own it until that land swap is finished. And my support as an officer for the land swap has been based on the land being of equivalent value and us owning the land. But until the town owns the land, uh, you know, we could not really affect a land swap with the Kaminskis. 
Mr. Kapinski um, showed me a copy of the letter that he wrote and your response. And in that response, it's you indicated that the land swap should be concluded within three months. Now, we've well and truly exceeded that. Um, ha has there been any communication with Mr. Kapinski? There's been no further communication with Mr. Kapinski at this stage. Uh, that concludes my questions. Thank you. Mr. Yates. <coughs> Don Yates, 10 Thompson Road, Success Hill. Um, I think what one of the issues that has come out tonight is this idea of trust. Um, because as people like um, Bruce Kay and others have mentioned, uh, we have not had the education department planning, let alone building, planning any more classrooms in Bassendine for almost a decade. Now that is a blight against the council for not engaging with to get the planning into place. I know of at least two residents in Bassendine who gave up or didn't replace their hot water system because they thought, like Mr Bruce Kay was talking about, that things would happen within three years. One particular gentleman put up with no hot water for 18 months, two winters, eventually died. This is the sort of thing that this council, by sitting on your thumbs, has not done. You don't, the community just, just has no, is losing trust in this council, in this administration, day by day. Six months ago, I asked a couple of questions of staff. One, how many car parking bays are there at the shopping centre on site, stroke, off street? Mr. Reid, would you like to give me an answer? Even approximate. Uh, um, I believe I've answered that question. No, no, Listen. how many, please? No, I, Mr. Yates, what I, point are you trying to make? I well, he spoke of 450 car parking bays in July, August last year. Mm -hmm. There's 310. This town has been dudded because we don't have the Bassendine Activity Centre in place. We've been dudded more than 400 car parking bays. And according to Transport, the replacement price per car parking bay is $45,000 each. So this town has been gutted something like $20 million because you guys don't know what you're doing. Another question again of Mr Haygart. Last question, Mr Yates. Mr Haygart, that in the DAP decision to do with the Bassanine Shopping Centre, the town community was going to benefit $380,000. We know of February 2018, the town never received $1 of that 2% benefit. Where did the $380,000 go? That is probably a question that needs to be directed to me. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't answer it this evening. And I understand that I have previously advised you. You've sought advice from the Minister's office that has given you a similar response, but I'll take that question on notice. I, I would you, think you'd need to answer that within Mr. seven Yates. days because the question was raised Mr. with Mr. you Yates, last me. August and you haven't given an answer. You've denied the community $380,000 with a 2%. Mr. Reid has given you his assurance that he will follow it up well, for you. you know, Mr. I had Yates, the same please assurance please back in July last year. You know, like As Mr. Reid said, and he's given One you final no, question Mr. and I'm going to sit down. Mr. 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 Simon Stewart Dawkins, how wide is the main ramp at the shopping centre? Mr. Yates, is it no, seven metres wide or, or more? Mr. Yates, we've had these conversations many times over the last few years and you're not happy with the answers you've been given. The answers aren't going to change, so we're just going to have to ag agree to disagree. I know these are things that you're passionate about, but the staff can't change the answers that they have to give you. That's the information they have available. You may disagree, but that is the information that we have to provide. So I'm sorry that you're not satisfied with that. The community has little and decreasing trust in this council and this staff when they don't know what Mr. should Yates, be under the Australian standard, no, the width of the Mr. main Yates, ramp. It should I be 11 metres, not Please don't not speak seven. over me. I would just like to reinforce that you need to speak on your own behalf and not on behalf of the entire community. Thank you. <laughs> I live here and lived here for 20 years. I use the ramp to the main shopping centre quite regularly. Mr. Yates, you suggest thank that you. I don't live here and I'm not a community member. I find that disappointing. No, I didn't I suggest that at all. I suggested that you are losing trust, no, but I don't believe that's true of everybody. No, I think the community is disappointed and losing trust in the council and the staff 
who don't know what they're doing. Thank you, Mrs May. All right. Are there any further questions that people would like to ask? <laughs> Mr Yates, the town has given a lot of time to your questions that you've already submitted. There were over eight pages of questions that you submitted. They will be, you will have answers provided, but I think we need to give the opportunity for the meetings to continue. Um, there are others who would like to maybe propose a motion or maybe go home for the night. So thank you, but that we're going to leave it there for this evening. Um, as part of the meetings, there's also an opportunity at these sessions if members of the public have a proposal or a motion that they'd like to put to the room, that we open that opportunity up for you. Um, if there is anybody that would like to propose something tonight, um, you have the opportunity to come and speak to that motion and then if there's somebody who would support that, um, it can be opened up for a vote from the room. Um, what happens with those motions that's, is that then council will consider them um, at their next council meeting. Um, it can be frustrating sometimes because at times there's a motion that's proposed by the room that's supported but then once council's provided with the additional information to put it in the context of how it would impact you know, the broader community, those things don't always follow through to direct action. But what we can guarantee is that if there are proposals that people want to put forward that we will, we will seriously consider them and see how um, we can make them work. So is there anybody that had a proposal that they wanted to put to the meeting this evening? Is that a no? Okay. Well, um, in that case, I just want to thank you all again um, for being here tonight and for your contribution. Um, it's been lovely meeting some new people and hopefully you'll be part of, um, of the th exciting things we have planned. Just before you leave, I just also wanted to make um, an announcement. One of our long-term staff members, Mr Michael Costrello, who's been the Director of Corporate Services for 11 years, um, has resigned. So we're going to be looking for a replacement um, for Mike um, as soon as we have had a review of that role. But I just want to formally thank Mike for his service for the town. Um, it's, you know, 11 years is a long time to commit um, to the town and just want to wish him all the best for his future. So thank you, everybody. And I'll close the meeting at 9 o'clock on the dot. Thank you very much.